Uh, good morning. Thank you very much, um, uh, Your Your Eminence, uh, Cardinal Echegari, um, Your Excellency Monsignor Marcelo uh, Sanchez Sorondo, Your Excellencies, the ambassadors, distinguished professors, scholars, uh, uh, participants, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it's a great honor and a pleasure to be able to return to the Vatican uh, since my earlier visit on the 14th of October to, to meet with Pope Francis prior to my trip to Lampedusa. Uh, and I'm grateful to the Holy Father and to uh, the Chancellor here of the Pontifical Academy for giving us all this opportunity for exchange on a very important subject. Um, I go to Malta tomorrow, and in recent times, I've been in Obok in Djibouti, which is the point that sticks out into the Red Sea from which most migrants embark on their journey to Yemen trying to get to Saudi Arabia. Uh, talking to my Australian colleague this morning, we've also seen the flows across the Indian Ocean and the seas around Indonesia and Australia. So we have a global phenomenon here in terms of irregular maritime arrivals. But we know from the news earlier this week that there are also irregular arrivals across the desert. When I was in the Sahara for two years, um, I head of our peacekeeping mission there, I used to hear of stranded migrants in the desert. We would send helicopters down to pick them up. And all of this simply to illustrate the, the globality and the urgency of this particular issue. Um, so I am very grateful to the Holy Father and to the Academy for the opportunity they've given us here, which I believe was one of the very first uh, points that he wished to make after the inauguration on 13th of March. Um, this is all preparatory, as I understand it, to a larger global meeting that would take place in the spring. Um, I won't look, I won't take a lot of your time. I want to do, first of all, I want to, I want to make three points. I want to talk about the need for greater practical protection to support the legal frameworks. I'd like to address just very briefly some of the root causes of human trafficking. And thirdly, to say that even if we do all of this well, we will fail if we do not address the public image of migrants uh, in terms of getting a greater focus on the contributions that they make. And I will summarize uh, at that point uh, in terms of saying the inevitability the necessity and the desirability of large-scale migration. Um, I want, first of all, to set the scene. You and I, we all are living in an era of unprecedented human mobility. And I think it's helpful to think about migration in terms of human mobility because mobili migration is sort of an outdated term. It looks like we're moving from A to B where we'll stay forever. Uh, and we're not looking at how people move the patterns today. Uh, you have today, again, the statistics are very soft. Uh, the first figure, 232 million international, is from the UN Department of Economic and Social Affairs. It's just been updated from an earlier figure of 214. The figure of 714 million is a figure from the United Nations Development Program. These are constantly updated, but they are ballpark, I don't know what figure you use here, but ballpark estimates as to what we're talking about. They're very soft, and I, and I simply use them to make the point that, he, that there are more people on the move today than at any other time in recorded history, numerically. Now, this reflects the fact that the 20th century was the first time in the history that the global population quadrupled. It's never happened before, unlikely to happen again, and I won't be around to be proved wrong. <laughs> so that is, that is the main driver uh, of, uh, of migration. Two interesting aspects, uh, 2010, of course, the first year in which there were more people living in cities than in the urban area, than in the rural areas. Uh, we plan to hold a major conference in 2015 on migrants in cities. I, I think uh, uh, Monsignor Sanchez and I spoke about this uh, a week or so ago. In, in terms of what's the effect of migrants on cities and cities on migrants, most of whom come from rural areas. And then, of course, we now have the feminization of migration when it, at least 50% of all migrants are women. Qualitatively somewhat different today than 15 years ago because more and more these are women who are following careers, career paths, et cetera. Uh, 
but just as vulnerable as ever all along the mi migration route. Recently on the Syrian border uh, with Jordan, I was uh, looking at some of the, the buses. We've taken about 400,000 migrants from the border of Syria to Jordan and Lebanon. And, and, and you see these people coming across. They're largely women and children. They are literally on their last leg as they make it to the border. So we have to be very aware that increasingly uh, women are going to need uh, support all along this way there. Now, uh, the domestic migrants of 740 million on my annual visit to China, I'm told every year, one year it was 200 million, now it's up to 230 million internal migrants alone in China who also deserve a certain amount of attention, even though that's not our preoccupation today. If, um, if you looked at them as a population group, um, they would be, migrants would represent a population somewhat smaller than Indonesia, somewhat larger than Brazil. The remittances they're sending home is about the equivalent of Saudi Arabia or Austria. That will go probably to 500 billion by the next uh, couple of years. So it's a, major, it's a major contribution that migrants are making, even though it goes very unrecognized. Uh, but the point is that migrants are vulnerable all along the migratory route from start to finish. And even after they get there, they very often are vulnerable, having no access to facilities and often having not proper papers. We never use the term illegal migrants. They're legal, they're people. They are irregular in the sense that they may have gotten there by some strange route, they may have no papers, et cetera, but they are irregular, not illegal. And that helps us also in getting away from the problem of laws that criminalize migrants. Our number one priority has to be saving life, whether it's sea or in the desert, and the other has to be to decriminalize how we treat uh, migrants. Um, the traffickers and human beings are, of course, part of the overall crime network. We've heard all the figures on that. I shall not repeat them. But I will underscore that we all have some responsibility uh, to bear in all of this. Uh, there is a strange and cruel irony. And this, is the sec this, is the counter this is the contradictory trend, a trend of increasing mobility and a trend of increasing anti-migrant sentiment. It's built on a lot of things. It's built on the fact of the global economic and financial crisis. It's built on the post 9-11 security uh, syndrome, the security preoccupation, fear of everybody being uh, a threat. And it's based on a fear that people perceive of a threat to their personal identity or even the national identity with all of these people coming in. We did a study in 2011 Italy, United States, and a number of other countries. Every country we, we polled, and we're working now very closely with the Gallup World Poll, showed that countries, a person's polled, es estimated the number of migrants in the country be at least double the actual figure. So it shows, again, a fear factor there that we have to try to get away from. Um, so we need to acknowledge our obligation to act and to move ahead. So that's the scene setter. Uh, I wanted just to... Uh, now talk just a bit about uh, the first point, which is need to give greater attention to practical protection. We need to be doing this on a daily basis. There's been a certain degree of progress, particularly in, in Europe, in creating legal frameworks designed to protect uh, migrants. Many countries, registered vic victims now have access to judicial systems, etc., uh, accommodation, medical care, etc. Uh, but IOM manages and supports around the world a number of support mechanisms. Shelters, we're doing a lot of this in partnership with many of you, working very closely with the church. Um, and we need to, to close the protection gap between uh, these nice categories we like to create, and we heard something about it this morning, how, who's a traffic victim, who's forced labor, et cetera. We need to provide protection to all of those who are vulnerable. Uh, i just like to hi highlight a few of the practical protections that we in our organization uh, are modestly trying to carry out uh, with the support of uh, many uh, member states. Uh, we are present, get to see, get this to work, there we go, sorry. We are present now in uh, 470 sites in 170 countries with 9,000 people around the world. 
a budget of about a billion dollars, mostly donor money, working in partnership, trying to provide protection to migrants wherever we are. Um, we are, have a global capacity to counter trafficking of human beings, often with the crucial support of partners such as the Pontifical Council for the Pastoral Care of Migrants and, 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 and Itinerants. And over the past few years, we've done a number of things to try to support. We've completed about 1,000 counter trafficking projects in 100 countries. We train tens of thousands of judicial uh, police and other uh, uh, authorities and law enforcement. We've assisted and protected some 50,000 victims of trafficking through shelters, psychosocial counseling, et cetera. We have mounted any number of public information campaigns to try to deter people from taking the trafficking uh, route. We've assisted governments in drafting new laws, and we tried to reuni reunite and assist under our assisted voluntary return and reintegration program uh, many victims of trafficking and others. We average about 70,000 voluntary assisted returns in the course of a year, not only for victims of trafficking, but many other vulnerable uh, and stranded migrants. Uh, so practical protection must be used to accompany these legal frameworks. Second point, some of the root causes of trafficking. We need to manage migrants uh, in crisis uh, comprehensively, long-term, and effectively in all situations. Let me give you the example of Libya. We got, along with our traditional partner, the UN High Commission for Refugees, we got a lot of good uh, publicity and media coverage, the fact that we took back 250,000 migrants to 54 countries uh, in the course of 2011 uh, at a cost of about $125 million. But we need to be frank, we did the job halfway. What do I mean? 177,000 of these were sub-Saharan Africans. We dropped them off in Mali, Niger, Burkina Faso, Chad, etc. Problem, these countries had no capacity to receive them, either for schools, clinics, uh, jobs. That's why they left in the first place. There was no livelihood there. And in addition, the remittances were finished. We can't do that again. We have to do it differently. We have to be linked up as a community. I'm talking particularly about the UN system, although we're not part of the UN. We're kind of like a kissing cousin or whatever they call it. Uh, we work closely with the UN. But we have to do it in a fashion next time that we're ready to go so that when we take people back like that, there is a, a, uh, a welcoming system, a way to help reintegrate and help governments to reintegrate their own citizens. Uh, Haiti, again, we helped. I was able to tell President Martelli uh, earlier this year on the commemoration of the earthquake of January, 2000, January 12, 2010. Mr. President, um, good news and bad news. Good news, 1.3 million of the victims of the earthquake living in tents are now in transitional housing. Bad news, 200,000 are still in tents. But what was happening? As we all were trying, there were hundreds and hundreds of NGOs, uh, other helpers there. As we were doing our, what we thought was, uh, I guess you'd say in this house, the Lord's work, Strange things were happening beneath our very eyes. Planes were flying in, taking children out, absolutely trafficking of the worst kind of sort, thinking the parents were dead, only to discover lady, later that the parents were alive and they no longer had their children. So again, we have to do it better. We have to be better organized, do it more comprehensively, and we have to do this in a longer term fashion. So uh, in, addressing these, uh, in addressing these root causes, uh, we have to look at the longer-term development challenges. Now, as you know, the Secretary General at the UN General Assembly this year, he announced the uh, holding of a World Humanitarian Summit in 2016. And we all very much applaud and support this idea. Uh, I would say that the greatest challenge at that summit is to answer the question, how are we all, those of us assembled in this room and others who want to be helpful, how are we going to manage what is a trend toward increasing multiple complex humanitarian emergencies? When the lights go off and the, and the big television networks leave, how do you keep a sustaining quality to what you do? How do you, at the same time you're dealing with Syria, not forget 
that we still have other, other problems in, in the Middle East and North Africa, that we still have Mali, uh, that we still have Haiti, et cetera. So being able to deal with all of these responsibly and effectively over the longer term is a challenge that I don't think that we have yet met or even begun to discuss in terms of the kind of political will and resources that will be required if we're going to address this all adequately. Um, we have to reduce exploitation effectively if we're going to do it, and I, I was pleased to hear this mentioned earlier, we have to address both the fundamental structure of supply and demand. Now supply has gotten all the attention, but we have to look at demand also. This is why we mounted a couple of years, two years ago, a, what we called a buy responsibly campaign that tried to show how many of our goods are actually made, they're the product of forced labor, in some cases slave labor. Uh, consumers need to be aware of their role uh, in, uh, in the um, trafficking area and how many of us have, have really thought at all about the uh, source and the origin of the products we buy and whether they might just have been made by forced labor. It's a difficult one to get our minds around, but we mustn't forget there is this demand side. On the supply side, I think from our side, at least there's a, a bit of potentially good news. We've been concerned for a long time about the problem of the corrupt and illegal and criminal recruitment agencies around the world. I'm not saying that they're all criminal or corrupt and illegal. I'm just saying that those that are need to be taken into hand. We will be launching in 2014 something we're going to call IRIS for the beautiful flower, the International Recruitment Integrity System. This is a little bit like the old Sullivan principles that helped get rid of apartheid in South Africa. It's a code of conduct. It's a set of standards. It's a way forward which a company, a recruitment uh, uh, office, can sign up to. I guess they'll receive a gold star or something to say that we're part of this network. And if you're not part of that network, you have to assume that you're probably corrupt and racist and illegal and all the other things that go with it. Now, the, the challenge that we face before we mount this is we have to have a very reliable, strong monitoring and compliance mechanism, or it won't work. People will sign up and then go about their, their usual ways. But I think this could help a lot in keeping people out of the hands of traffickers, many of whom are in these particular uh, recruitment agencies. Um, and then, of course, we've got to work a third point. We have to uh, work on uh, the problem of uh, how do we change the public image of migrants. We know that we're dealing with stereotypes. They're coming to take our jobs. They're probably bringing in a large criminal element. They're probably bringing in disease, uh, et cetera. But if you look at those demographic figures and you see the tens of millions of jobs that most highly industrialized countries are going to need, including Europe, including Japan, Korea, uh, probably others, the tens of millions of jobs they're not going to have by the year 2040, you have to ask the question, where are they coming from? Well, you have an aging north and a youthful south. Increasingly, they're going to come from the global south. Now, the responsible political answer to that would be we will mount a public information and public education campaign to talk about the historically overwhelmingly positive contribution that migrants have made. I happen to come from a country that, that was built on migration and continues to be built. In fact, I sometimes think we have more Italians than there are in Italy, but anyway, we, we're proud of our migrants. And, but we've got to recognize it. But, so if we don't do this, if we don't start preparing the public mind now, it won't finish well. But if we put in place measures that welcome people properly, offer them some options, including that of integration, it just might be that these people coming from the global south might just share the same values that we all share. Um, this is just some thinking that we're doing on that. I think, again, we plan to launch a global information campaign in the next year. Uh, with the limited means we have, we'll try to get others on board to try to talk about the historical contributions that migrants make. Um, the 3rd of October, we were all gathered in New York to talk about 
a high-level dialogue on migration and development. That same day, the large ship capsized off the shores of Lampedusa, and we know the story of that. Um, somewhere between 300 and 400 people lost their lives. When I was in Lampedusa, I talked to Syrians, I talked to Eritreans, I talked to Nigerians, I talked to others, a very mixed group. Some were clearly uh, uh, going to qualify for probably for political asylum. Some simply wanted to go north and join their families. Some were obviously headed by traffickers into some kind of forced labor, either forced labor, uh, prostitution, etc. cetera. Um, but the link between Lampedusa and New York was poignant that morning, uh, as, if any of us, as if any of us needed reminding. Uh, so we need, to, we need to recognize that migration is central to these challenges and that countries are increasingly in the same boat, countries of origin, and we're countries of transit, and we're countries of destination at the same time. So in a globalized world, we need to think about these linkages. And we're going to have to learn to conjugate better than in the past the paradox between national sovereignty and individual freedom. How you bring those two elements together in your policies is largely going to determine uh, the kind of uh, 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 our ability to tackle uh, the uh, question of trafficking. Um, so uh, I, I want to just f uh, finish with a couple of points here. Um, we also have to reduce the cost of migration. We'll get at that with, her, with the, uh, uh, the recruitment agencies, but also with the costs of transferring remittances home. Those should be down around uh, a couple of percentage points only rather than the 10 and 12 percent that some people are paying. Uh, the loss in human life. Um, too many migrants is, are, are still perishing on their journey, as in Lampedusa or in Malta. Too many are still suffering gross abuses of their rights. Too many are still obliged to take up work that fails to uh, fall short of their own uh, qualifications. And too large a share of migrants' earnings uh, are now going uh, to the uh, cost of transfer. Let me end on a somber note, even a confessional note, and perhaps that's appropriate in, this, in this, uh, hallowed, uh, these hallowed halls here. Um, Despite all our efforts, um, information campaigns, protection, uh, prosecution, where we've done very little, uh, prevention, all of that, we have to ask the question, have we really made any impact at all on the global problem of trafficking? I leave that question with you, but I would, for my part, I would say there's a lot of room for honest doubt. Uh, and I don't say that to make anybody feel badly, but we've simply somehow they've got to organize ourselves better for this. Um, if you take, we built a, a migrant resource center in Djibouti at Obok, that point at, in the Red Sea there I was talking about, uh, paid for by the Japanese government, helped us really. So we counsel people when they get that far, don't go across. And they say, I understand, I understand. The next question is, do you have a job for me? The answer is, no, I don't have a job for you. I'm just giving you information. So then they continue their journey and go across. So our information campaigns are falling short because we haven't asked, answered the livelihood uh, question. Prosecutions are few, few and far between, and the big fish never get caught. Um, so I think we've got to do a lot better. Let me conclude by leaving you with the thought that um, uh, large-scale migration, which is means more and more people are going to be victims of trafficking. Large-scale migration is inevitable because of the demography I gave you. Also, the digital revolution. What, you had 300 million people connected to the internet in 2000? Today, it's 2 billion. People like Mark Zuckerberg and others are saying it'll be 7 billion soon. People know what's going on if they have access. Uh, we've got uh, distance shrinking and budget shrinking transport. We've got the growing number of disasters. We've got the economic social divide between North and South. So the drivers of migration are clearly there. And more and more people are going to be on the road or on the sea. And we have to realize that therefore it's inevitable. It's also necessary if those 30, 40 million jobs that we talked about are going to be filled by mid-century. And it's also highly desirable if we put in place the kinds of policies that will reflect the global trends that I started uh, in talking to you. So I've tried to say something uh, in a 
kind of a wandering way, I'm sorry for that, about uh, the, the whole question of greater practical protection for migrants to match up with the law enforcement uh, frameworks, the need for uh, a greater, closer look at the root causes, and then thirdly, to try to change the public perception that would allow migrants to get a better deal. Thank you.